This week, the Clarets sign off on yet another successful Premier League campaign. This is the end of season None and Ever podcast. Hello and welcome to an end of season special Known and Ever podcast. I'm your host Natalie Bromley and joining me for our celebration of the end of the season and the start of the summer are quite a few members of Team Known and Ever this evening. Very, very welcome back to the show, Rich. Yeah, uh, hi Natalie. Uh, It's good to be on and to review uh, the season and where we go moving forward through the summer. Definitely. We've also got Tom, Claret Tom. Tom, hello, hello, hello. Hi, Natalie. Thanks for having me on. Glad to have survived another season, uh, not just in the Premier League, but on the podcast as well. Definitely. I think I might need to be asking for your autograph later on. You've got a bit Twitter famous throughout this season, Tom, so we might have to, to keep an eye on that. Um, and then joining us for the end of season special, combining both of our worlds, is the main man himself, the horse, well, the, the course, actually. Am, am I the maybe the course, the, the star, shall we say, of the preview show, the main man himself, Dave Statman-Roberts. Dave, welcome to this crossover episode. Hello, Natalie. Uh, glad to be uh, invited and uh, involved. Yeah, definitely. So, listeners, we have got a bit of a party atmosphere this week because we are celebrating the end of a season. It is done and dusted. The Clarets, of course, securing their Premier League survival after that Fulham game. Um, But we're done. We're going to spend a sixth consecutive season in the Premier League next season. We have kept pretty much everybody intact. We've all managed to not age, about another 30 years, and we all lived to tell the tale. Uh, We've started to get fans back in the stadium and things are just starting to feel back to normal. And what a podcast we have for you to celebrate all of that. We are going to analyse what I like to call the post-Fulham crash, the three games that we played following that survival um, that survival game, I guess, where we secured our Premier League status for next season. We're going to have a look at what it felt to have fans back in the stadium at that Liverpool game. We're going to talk about players leaving us and possible players coming in. We're going to once again talk about Dice rumours. When are we ever not talking about Dice rumours? But we've obviously got that managerial merry-go-round, so we'll have a look at that as well. Um, Dave is joining us this week to round up the... Uh, FPL news from the previous show. Those of you who don't listen to the previous show, where have you been all season? Uh, but we are, in fact, also going to crown our known and ever FPL winner. And then finally, the team are going to dish out the known and ever end of season alternative awards. What a show. So let's get going. Who, gentlemen, wants to kick off with how are we feeling post Fulham crash? Three games, three losses. Not looking ourselves. Somebody dive right in and tell me how they're feeling. I would say, you know, the the games were a disappointment. They weren't great to watch. They weren't enjoyable to watch. But you know, now it's it's quite a good time to do the podcast. I think not uh not immediately sort of basking in the aftermath of the poor performances, the defeats. But you can look back on the season as a whole um, and think about you know the fact that really the objective for the season was achieved. Uh, if you'd have offered us safety with three games to spare after, you know, the, the first seven or eight games, you'd have bit your hand off for it. Um, you know, the Leeds performance, think the heads really went down at, at, at 2-0. Liverpool, we put a, a good fight. We were just playing a better team. We had more to play for. And then Sheffield United, well, it, you know, it's a dead rubber and uh, and we had some big players missing as well. So, yeah, well, the games are disappointing. They weren't great to watch, apart from obviously being in, in the ground for the Liverpool game. But, uh, you know, overall, it's a successful season, and uh, and we can look back and take stock now, and and be happy with the way the season's gone as a whole, even if the last three games were disappointing. Yeah, I think that's fair, Rich. I guess my I always have a bit of a quandary with this towards the end of the season. It's always that argument between the man management and the competitive edge, isn't there? I mean, from my perspective, I kind of don't really begrudge these players just once they put the shift in that they did, just, you know, relaxing for the rest of the season and just getting done what they need to get done. But then at the same time, you want the squad to stay competitive and you also want to try and climb the league to get some prize money. So I guess, where do you sit in that debate? Do you think we should have tried to win the games more? I think it's a difficult one to say, you know, try to win the games more. I think you want to win every, any any football match that you're playing. You know, when I played in 
you know, school lunchtime games, you, you know, you want to win. So never mind a professional, you know, game in the, in the Premier League. But I think Dice just said, I think at the elite level, when you just go off it, maybe that, you know, that 1%, it makes, so, it, 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 it makes such a big difference. I thought the performance against Leeds, second half, we wasn't very good. But first half, I thought we played well. Liverpool, you know, maybe maybe was a little bit unlucky. You know, goal, goals been just before half time in either of those two games cost us. And Sheffield United was rubbish. Uh, yeah. You know, there's no excuse in that. But I think, like Tom said, I think it's a good time to have the podcast a few weeks after the season's finished where you can sit down a little bit more objectively rather than emotionally. And it is disappointing because you're looking and you, you know, you want to finish higher up. 17th never looks good, especially after coming 10th last season, you know, so it's clear, um, you know, you know, decline from last season in a way. But after the same time as Dice says a lot, two two points after seven games, you know, you you would have snapped his your hand, his hand off to be, um, you know, safe with three games to go and come com- comfortably safe too. So yeah, it's disappointed, but quite expected, unfortunately. Yeah, just picking up on that actually, Rich, it's quite an interesting point, and it's one I want to pick your brains on. I know you you're obviously very passionate about sport and, and you you know you're giving that example of playing in the playground and you want to win every single game but you do play sport competitively does it does it not change the mindset though once you know that there's effectively nothing to play for it must be very difficult to get up for a game when you've you've got that on your mind yeah not very well um you're saying competitively but not I very didn't. well <laughs> i didn't um... offer judgment either way rich still <laughs> yeah oh yeah it's a funny one. You can look at it, like I said before, and if you just go off it by that 1%, you know, especially at that top, top level, it's, it's different in, you know, kind of lower level sport. But again, Liverpool had something more to play for. Maybe Sheffield United in front of their home fans wanted to finish on a high. But alternatively, you could say that, you know, we could have played with the pressure and the freedom off. But um, it, it does seem such a funny coincidence that in, I think, you know, again, it's great that we've got Dave on because he can back up the rubbish that we all talk. Um, but it does seem in the last three seasons that, you know, we have just completely, you know, just just five. Okay, fair enough then. Uh, <laughs> Dave put his hand up there. That, this, is, this, is, this is why he's great that he's on. You know, we yeah, have just is. been really poor at the end of the season. So, um, yeah, it's annoying. But, but again... What I, I did tweet out that the lads have given everything. You know, we've had such a small squad. You know, the yeah. manager said in a couple of interviews post-season that he's mentally fatigued, you know. So I think it was kind of more of a relief that we've yeah. got promoted. And yeah. We've got promoted? We survived, you mean? Oh, uh, relegate. Uh, survived, <laughs> sorry. I don't My even know. God, that... It's been that long since the season's finished. <laughs> that did take it out of you, didn't it? Um <laughs> Um, no, it is. It's a really interesting point, and actually, it does it does make me laugh. Uh, it, it's as if we know each other well enough that we know exactly where we're going with this podcast. Because very much my next um, movement was to come to you, Dave, and say, as Tom quite eloquently tweeted during the game, is that it feels like death taxes and Burnley being rubbish once we survive Premier League status. So, hit us with the facts, Dave. Is it? Are we being paranoid? Or are we always rubbish once we've survived? No, it, well, I, I, I saw Tom's tweet and I, I tweeted out myself. The um, I looked back at the last five seasons and the last three games of each of those seasons and we'd won one game. The only match we won was the one against uh, already, already relegated Norwich City who were down to nine men. That's the only match wow. out of the 15 we won. So we, we, I think we drew three and lost 11. So, yeah, the stats are there to, to back it up the last five seasons. We have been... Uh, tailing off towards the end, let's say. Yeah, definitely. I mean, how do you feel about that, Dave? Do you? I, I'm very much in camp. I'm all right with with these. It's, it's always disappointing, and I didn't really want to finish 17th. But how many times on the preview show did you and I just say, "Look, we just need to get over the line now, and, and we'll get there." Um, it, I, I think I share Rich's views. It, just, it, I wasn't bothered. I was quite happy for these players just to just relax and just try and take the load off and and just get to the end of the season. It didn't feel disappointing to me. Yeah, I think the expectations change. When you had two points after seven games, um, you go into a season thinking, yeah, we were 10th last year. Can we build on that? Can we improve on it? And then you get the start we had, which was such a poor start. We didn't uh, 
we didn't hit the ground running at all. We had the sort of short gap uh, between seasons, didn't really work for us. We had players missing at the start and we didn't really uh, start to get going until probably into maybe November. Um, so when when you take that into account, where we finished up, 11 points clear of Fulham was a, was a good result, but it is all relative compared to where you were earlier on. Yeah, definitely. Um, Tom, just before we came on air as we were preparing just to start recording, um, Rich did a quick aside for us and said, as a quick aside, Bailey Peacock Farrell or Pharrell Williams, as he's known on the preview show, um, is having an absolute stormer for Northern Ireland. It just reminded me of something I'd probably forgotten and it's maybe something that we need to discuss really, that Pope's injury towards the end of the season, which absolutely soul destroyingly for him has ruled him out of the Euros has meant that we have um, tinkered around with with, uh, Peacock Farrell and with Will Norris and with the greatest respect to both of them it did highlight that we maybe don't have the strength in depth at the keeper that we maybe did three or four years ago. Yeah from the days when we had three England internationals battling for the number one spot it does look like a big drop off in quality. It's a funny one with Peacock Farrell because when I watch him he doesn't seem that bad to me, technically. Like it, it, He doesn't seem to make that many howling areas where you think, how's that gone in or what's he done there? I think the Man City away game apart, I think he chucked a couple in his own net there and VAR saved him. But it, it, to me, it's not a coincidence that we always seem to lose 3 or 4 nil when he's in goal. I think uh, his record is something like, it, it's double figures, Dave will know, of course, but it's double figures conceded in, in only a few games in the Premier League. Um, and I think you probably got... Uh, an indication as well that there's a bit of a lack of confidence in him from the management as well because I don't think Norris would have played certainly not both of the last two games if they, if they thought Peacock Farrell was performing at the level he should be performing at the argument I think for the Liverpool game was well you know he's been an understudy this season and he deserves a, a run out which I mean, you know it's, it's not something you normally hear them talk about for a third choice keeper you know it's not as if they gave Matt Jokes a couple of Premier League games or anything like that and um, and I was really surprised actually that Norris played in the, the Sheffield United game. To me, that was an indication that they don't actually, you know, they don't rate Peacock Farrell. They're not confident putting him in there. But then Norris didn't do himself any favours either. So, for, I mean, it's imperative that we keep hold of Pope next season and that we keep him fit. I think if, if he was to, to get a bad injury or if he was to leave, then we really would be struggling in that position next season. And I think it's going to be a make or break season for Peacock Farrell. He, he's going to need to really impress and and turn around his form, I think, if he wants to, a long-term future at the club. Uh, good good to hear that he's playing well for his country tonight. Hopefully that kind of thing does, uh, you know, does uh, help him establish a position here. But I think if uh, if he's serious about being a Premier League player and, and serious about being a long-term replacement for Pope, we're going to have to see a massive improvement for him in his, in his next few games. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's fair enough. I think it's been... It's been an interesting one, hasn't it? Because defensively, we rely on that core defence. Um, and we've we've been worried, I think, for a few months now. And, and I know, Rich, you've got some quite strong feelings about Tarky because we, we talked about this last week when we when it was end of season take one, which we couldn't quite get off the ground because we had some technical issues. Um, but I know you were quite, you know, at some point we've talked about the potential that we could lose both Pope and Tarky in the summer transfer window, which would be nothing short of an absolute disaster. But you're quite adamant that Tarky's going to stay, aren't you, Rich? You don't think we're going to we're going to lose him? Oh. I just from the noises I hear, uh, well, not I hear, just I'm just purely going off Twitter. It doesn't seem like he'll leave. It seems like the most logical solution is, um, you know, for him to run down his contracts until the end of next season. But like I said, you know, I'm not his agent or anything. So, oh <laughs> damn it, really? Know. But why, why are I you on the that, podcast? Yeah, I had you, know, you on yeah. for that. <laughs> uh, well, some people would believe, you know, some people would, be, you know, think that we're in the know, um, and that's why, uh, you know, but you know what. I was on a board meeting last week with PC. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, t- ticket you know, conspiracy. He took me aside. out for dinner. You know. Yeah, yeah, he took me out for dinner and said who the transfer targets are, but he said keep it quiet, <laughs> so I won't divulge that on the podcast. But I think, like Tom said, I think it is crucial we keep both of them. Um, but it's a, but it's a funny one if if somebody comes in with thirty million plus for Tarkovsky with a year left in his contract, can you say no from, from the business model point of view when you're looking at, you know, they had this so-called debt that the club's got to got to pay back? I do find it interesting, though, going away from Tarkovsky, staying a little bit. There's only five clubs 
who've actually, who actually conceded more goals than us this season. I've just checked that, Dave. So unless I'm completely useless, um, uh, 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 looking at football tables, um, yeah. So it's kind of it's a funny one defensively this season. At times we've looked really really solid, and and then other times we've looked really open. I, I think I did say it on the last couple of podcasts that I was on that. We've seen to have played this style that's a bit more on the front foot, pressing higher, but it's left us exposed at the gap, uh, at the back, sorry, and maybe exposed yeah. Tarkovsky's weaknesses a little bit more where, you know, strikers and fast attacking players have run at him. But yeah, it is crucial that, you know, those those three, when when they're, when they're playing well, they're fit and they have a run again, you know, we you know we do pick up points and we and without them our record in the Premier League this season has quite frankly been appalling. Again, Dave Dave would know, but it's something like zero point one point per game when one of those is missing. I think I think it's really low like that. I see. You see, this is this is a really interesting Dan. I'm making this this game. Uh, sorry, this podcast, Dave, because. Normally they've like Dave and uh, sorry Tom and Rich are both really cavalier and they're just like yeah and they, they throw these stats around but because you're on they get really nervous and they like fact checking themselves they're like oh Dave will know or let's just double check Dave um I listen I don't want to put you on the spot Dave but I don't suppose you have anything that backs up what Rich is saying uh, I, I don't have that I mean it, it, off the top of your head you know that you know when the players were missing the start of the season and we've had Pope out at the end uh, towards the end of the season we haven't picked the points up so it stands to reason that we haven't been as good um, I don't have the exact figures time what I do know and I had checked um 77 games that trio the uh, holy trinity Pope Tarkovsky and me have played together for Burnley now 77 games which you look at some of the you know going back in time to through history in terms of uh, partnerships in a team you don't get that many where all all three players have played together. So they're building on that. And hopefully we can get that over 100 next season, have all three in together, fit for the majority of the season. We can get that figure above 100 uh, during next season. Yeah, that would be amazing if we could. Again, I have read somewhere that, that we're after two centre-halves this summer with a, with a view to Taki do going, you know, maybe, you know next Again next summer, so so we so we so we got two players, two centre arts training. I know there's been the likes of like Warhol, uh, Phillips, I think who's who's the other one, Collins from Stoke. It's really crucial this summer that we get a you know two and you know if not two but one centre half to come in, you know to you know to train regularly, um, you know so that they can come into the side in 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 twelve months because long and done simply aren't good enough as that first choice back up whoever you pick. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a really good point. And I, and I think I go back to what we were saying before about Pope and having the strength and depth of keepers. And I would say the same thing about our centre-half position. And it's felt like our successes in the Premier League, we've always had, you know, when we had Michael Keeney and we had Tarky before him, et cetera, et cetera, we've always had somebody who was there to be able to take over. And it, you're right, Jimmy Dunn and, and Kevin Long just don't seem to have it at the moment. And it's just... It's something else, really, where we've known for some time that we just desperately need to reinforce during the summer, and this is our chance now. Um, it's interesting. Did I see as well that is it Nat Phillips? Who's that? Liverpool? Who's that? Is it Nat Phillips, a Liverpool defender we've been linked with as well? But I think you know that's that's quite an ambitious statement. So hopefully, if the, if these games are coming thick and fast, uh, sorry, these signings are coming thick and fast, and we can get them in early. I think that's another thing I want to see this season as well. Is I don't want players to be coming in a week before the season starts. Like get them in and start getting them training. Tom, coming back to you then. Um, talking about players going out, we've of course since the end of the season lost Robbie Brady, which I think we were all expecting. But still felt a little bit sad. It felt like that was quite a sad end to a to the end of an era for, for Brady leaving us. Yeah, the money we paid for him, and and I think uh, I, as people that listen will know that I'm I'm a big fan of Brady. I think the link up between him and Defoe, especially in the first half of the 17-18 season when we made Europe, I think that was a big a big reason for the, the good football we were playing, the the, the achievement that we had that season. Uh, I went to the Bournemouth away game, which I think was the last one that he played before he got injured. Him and Defoe absolutely ran that midfield. He scored a cracker with his week of foot. Leicester away then he was he was running about like a you know, like a man possessed and then he got the injury and just never the same player since. Obviously never recovered properly, never got back to full fitness. And it had probably uh, stayed maybe a year too late because I think the the longer that he was with us in and out of the team, niggly injuries, the more people kind of forgot how good he was in that first sort of season and a half. Um 
um, for the best, I think, for all parties now that he moves on and, and gets another club. Maybe he'll be reunited with Hendrick at Newcastle. There's a lot of rumours about Celtic as well. But, yeah, wherever he goes, wish him well. I think he was a good player. Um, and just, just a shame that injuries meant that we really have to be the best of him. Yeah, definitely. And I think it feels a little bit like... Yeah, you're quite right, Tom, in that people have, have kind of felt, oh, it's, yeah, good, I'm glad he's got rid of him, his injury plan, blah, blah, blah. But that season that he got injured, that Leicester game, he was one of, if not the best player that we had in our squad at the time. And people also forget that goal against Blackburn as well. It's like how, you know, for my eyes, if you have a Burnley player and you score against them in a Burnley shirt, you will be a hero forever. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you do. Um, but that does, again, uh, Rich, leave us a little bit, short in midfield though and again you know wingers is if we just don't have wingers at the club full stop and now we've also got rid of one um we've said this time after time after time but my god surely we're putting wingers on the top of the shopping list yeah i think that's probably the number one position that we do need to strengthen um you know we need at least two wingers in you know for me we you know we need wingers with pace who can who can create you know, it's it's been too long where, you know, been having Hendrick on the right wing, Brownhill, you know, Brady trying to come in. I really like Gunmanson, but obviously he's just had so many injury problems. So yeah, for me that's a priority position. We need two wingers, uh, you know, to come into the team. You know, and as you know, there has been criticism of McNeil, maybe rightly so at times. Um, you know, he's not had his best season, but at, but but to counter that, it's a young lad who's obviously you know taking on a lot of the responsibility and, and a lot of the creative burden and when he doesn't kind of produce I think it does really stand out so he needs help I'm sure we'll talk about other positions um shortly but you know for me we need a lot of players this summer we need a lot of players you could argue you know we could strengthen in every position I know that won't won't, won't happen but you know winger and centre half and for me another centre midfielder who can really who's got a lot of quality at, at the ball, who can drive us forward a little bit more. Um, you know, for me, they're, they're, they're the three main priority positions. Yeah, definitely. I think that's fair. Um, well, we'll have to wait and see. Let's see what happens. It feels like there's a little bit of activity already, which is really good. Um, and we will we'll see what Mr Pace delivers. Um, now, before we move on to, to talk about a couple of other things, um, Dave... This must also happen every single season as well. Um, but of course, we're having to deal with Dash rumours. Is Dash going to Palace? Is Dash not going to Palace? He hasn't signed a new contract yet. We talk about players on there, but it's equally as important to get Dash signed up to a new contract. Um, transfer talk aside, rumour mills aside, what's your gut telling you, Dave? Is he staying or is he going? Uh, my gut feel is he's going to stay. I think that... Um... Jobs are coming up. You know, we, we're aware that uh, the Everton positions uh, available. There's uh, uh, Wolves still not been sorted out. I don't think. I think they had someone in mind, but other than that's definitely been sorted. And obviously, Crystal Palace that we know about. I can't see it. I don't think he's going to get the control at any of the. Well, I'm, I'm not sure he's going to be considered for for Everton. I think Palace is a possibility, but again, they might be more likely to go for someone where they've not got to pay compensation. Um, and I don't think he'd get the control at Crystal Palace that he gets at Burnley. I don't think he's going to get that control at any other club, um, certainly in the Premier League. So um, I think that with a bit more reassurance from the board, uh, the new board, and also some funds in the summer, then that should keep things ticking over and we'll get a, another season at least. Yeah, well, we certainly hope so. I mean, from your perspective, Tom... I... It seems it seemed a few years ago that every single time a manager got sacked or moved on or, to, or got poached by another team, that we were all on tenterhooks going, oh my God, he's going to go, he's going to go. And it does feel that the longer he stays at Burnley and, and the more perceived negativity there is around the style of football that he plays, that his name seems to drop off those lists quite quickly. I know that the book has put him as, as favourites for the Palace job quite quickly, but that seems to have petered off now. Um I, I generally feel now that there's not that many sides in the Premier League that we're in danger of losing him to. Yeah, I think a lot of the sort of the next step jobs, if you like. Um, so, so like Palace, for me, is a bit of a sideways move. You might get a bit more money there. But I, um, I mean, maybe you would want it. I don't know. But personally, I don't see it as a massive attraction, especially with such a big rebuilding job for them this summer. 
a lot of the sort of next step up jobs. So you look at clubs like maybe Everton, and West Ham, Leicester. You know, Leicester and West Ham aren't going to want to get rid of their managers anytime soon. I think Everton, you know, the fact that they appointed Ancelotti shows you that probably the the idea is a big name, like it's a, a trendy name. Um, and if they can attract someone like Ancelotti, then perhaps they back themselves to attract maybe a, a more big name manager for the next appointment as well. Uh, the Dyche interest seemed to be a few years ago, and I haven't really heard him spoken uh, around the Everton job this time. So that's quite encouraging. And hopefully, it, once these avenues do close, um, you know, I think once the Palace, Everton, uh, Wolves, Shrubs, like we said, have, have been taken and been occupied, um, then I think the avenues for, for moving do close. And then hopefully that will be what persuades him to, to put pen to paper and sign a new contract. And if he does sign that new contract, then uh, we can all be a bit more confident going forward with the uh, with the planning and the rebuilding. So fingers crossed that, that happens sooner rather than later. Amen to that, young Tom. Amen to that. Um, well, before we move on to dish out some end of season awards, Rich, and we'll just sign off on those um, post Fulham crash games. Of course, there was a very exciting game in the middle where Burnley hosted Liverpool at home, and we were there. All of Team None and Ever were there. We, Rich, I saw you in person. It was amazing. Um, talk us through just the emotion of that night of getting back into the ground. Yeah, I think it was only George was the only member of the known in ever team who never got to go on her and I know he was gutted about that at the time. So but but George doesn't sit on the uh, on the board on the board meetings with Alan Pace like the rest of us does. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was amazing to be back. Um, you know, the weather was fantastic as well. You know, the best part of that game actually for me was when the players walked out for the warm what what out for the warm up, you know that was absolutely amazing. I've never seen a cheer like that for a warm up, and you know the atmosphere all the way through the game, and you know everybody who you spoke to around the ground. Obviously, it was great seeing you, Natalie, in person for the first time. I seen other 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 Clarets who, who I only see at games, and everybody was in such a good mood. It was just a shame that you know I can't. Obviously, it took a little bit of the gloss away. Losing, you know, in, you know, imagine if we won, or even if Chris Wood scored that chance, uh, you know, to go one nil up, you know, it would have been, you know, brilliant. But oh god, yeah, you know, fingers crossed that you know we're able in August to get back in turf more, uh, you know, somewhat more, you know, more normal than what it was um, against Liverpool and get a full house as you know as soon as possible. And I'm I'm going to away games. That's something I miss going to getting in the car. Early in the morning, you know, when you finish work on a Friday night, looking forward to getting up early on a Saturday, you know, and spending the whole day. Uh, yeah, so fingers crossed it, you know, it, it can happen. I'm really excited for the for the Euros, you know, seeing ho- hopefully good sized crowds in as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, Dave, I know you and I have spoke about going to away games quite a bit as well, because I know there were a couple of, of times where you thought you might be doing uh, the player commentary last season, it didn't quite, quite come off. But I think, I think just the difference that it seemed to me just being able to watch the game live than being stuck behind watching television, it just felt different. And the players seemed to up the game because I think out of the three games that we played post Fulham, the Liverpool was, the, I thought, the best performance out of all of it. It was like they played for the crowd. Yeah, it was obviously a disappointing match against uh, Leeds United, particularly the second half. Uh, Leeds, we were certainly the first half, we were well up for it, defending really, really well. And then it was a shame, A, not to uh, score when we had the chance and then to concede just before half-time. I think we'd, uh, we could have just put, you know, kept kept it tight for another couple of minutes, got it to nil-nil at half-time. I think it might have been a little bit different. But I think sort of uh, the fact that we conceded just before the break and then sort of six, seven minutes afterwards, once that second goal went in, it was, uh, you know, we weren't going to come back from that, I don't think, even with the uh, support in there. But, yeah, I mean, result aside, it was it was great to be in the ground, albeit with just three and a half thousand, as uh, Rich said. We'd like to see, hopefully, the, the circumstances be right for a lot more fans to be in there for the start of next season. Yeah, definitely. And, and what about you, Tom? Are, are, you, are you looking forward to the away fans? And, and I guess the main question for you is, is that how much are you going to be charging your Twitter fans for selfies next season? <laughs> hey, I'm not the one who uh, who was, was taking selfies outside the ground after my appearance on, on BBC One. So, you know, don't uh, don't come at me with that. No, you see, I'm not having that, Tom. You're a, you're a Twitter celebrity now. Your, your tweet, everybody wants you. <laughs> 
it's not it was nice to do a, a live one I, I did have a couple of requests so i thought i'd uh, i'll give the people what they want but yeah really nice to be back in the ground shame about obviously the result and obviously the the uh, restrictions and things like that don't don't make it the exact same experience but one step closer to normality and uh yeah hopefully we'll be able to do a few more next season and uh, and the people who unfortunately missed out will will get a chance as well yeah, definitely. And I think I've seen something this week. I think Robbie maybe posted in our in our team thread, didn't he, that they are now taking deposits, aren't they, for the second wave of, of season tickets. So it's, you know, they're starting to tentatively make plans to get more fans back next season. So, oh God, fingers crossed. Um, guys, if you were at the game, if you're one of those three and a half thousand, you drop us a line and let us know how you felt to be back at Turf more. You know how to get in touch with us. You can tweet us at None and Ever, or you can email us at podcast at net. We want to hear your stories about what it felt like to be back on the turf. Um, I'm going to wrap it up there in terms of um, end of season performances. You know, they were quite forgettable games uh, in some respects, and I don't really want to dwell. Um, you know, the, the, the lads, we've well, said before, the lads put in a phenomenal shift last season and, and got over the line. Um, and actually, one of the, the, the really important points is that they got us over the line with 11 points clear. Uh, and in, in other seasons, being 11 points clear of 17th place will see you a lot higher up the table than 17th. So, um, job done. Um, very proud of the boys. Very proud of the resilience. And, you know, we go again next season, hope with some no, new bodies. Um, so let's move on to the final two points we want to sign off this season. And Dave, I'm going to hand over to you because you have got to round up for us um, our known and ever fantasy Premier League. Now, a lot of our listeners have not been following, I say a lot, not that many actually, we've got quite similar figures, but uh, there are some listeners out there who haven't been tuning into the preview show and you are missing a massive gem. Um, Dave is our stat man and every Friday night he gives us all the lowdown on our next opponents and it's just a fantastic entertaining Friday night show but as part of that podcast we um, run a non and ever fantasy Premier League so if we've got any fantasy managers out there uh, we'll be running it again next season we'll put the code on social media and you can join us uh, we had a record number of entrants I think this year Dave if I remember rightly and we have a winner to crown so I'm going to hand over to you Statman Dave and why don't you round up for us all of the preview show non and ever FPL news yeah, well, we've got um, a final table. We obviously know the uh, last game we we lost to Sheffield United, but all the other matches were took place together on that Sunday. Uh, and from that, we have a final table. So I'll give you a rundown of our top 10 managers. Uh, starting in 10th place uh, was Steve Holden with 2,373 points. Uh, in ninth place was Andrew Smith, 2,388 uh, eighth place, Alex Maxwell with 2389. Uh, and then going up to seventh, uh, Charlie Bins at uh, 2405. Um, and then the rest all the way up were all non movers. So we didn't actually have any uh, changes towards the top. It was all really tight in there with the scoring. Uh, sixth place was Joseph Golby, 2430. Uh, Gary Proctor in fifth place, 2447. Uh, Chris Stanworth in fourth place, 2469. Uh, and then our top three, uh, we had uh, the team Alison Bexer, uh, manager Urse, uh, got 59 points of the week as our third place manager on 2469. And then two managers who've been up there pretty much all the season. I think we had them uh, both on the show. Um, Adam Dennett was in second place with his do or Deitch team, uh, 2474. Uh, and then first place, a 24-point lead at the top, uh, was Gotham FC, uh, Sean Danaher, who, again, we uh, had on the podcast a couple of times for the previous show during the season. Uh, he just clung on at the end, uh, and he was our overall champion. Well done to uh, Sean Danaher. And it's worth mentioning, he was also 23rd in the entire world amongst Burnley fans. When you enter uh, the FPL at the start of the season, you specify a team who you support, and Sean was uh, 23rd among all the Burnley fans that are out there. What I want to know, though, is why aren't the other 22 in our league? 
Yes, definitely. <laughs> let's let's stoke down those 22 uh, and, and give Sean a, a run for his money next year. Well, Sean, congratulations. That is definitely some achievement. And we were we were rooting for you. We were rooting for Adam as well, actually, because we had both Adam and Sean on the previous show towards the end. And it was, they're both really great guys. So it would have been fine, whoever won. But um, Sean definitely kept his cool at the end of that and took down the trophy. Um, producer Matt will be in touch, Sean, because we do have a trophy for you or a prize of some description. And it's not just a known and ever sticker although they are very very valuable so we will send you a sticker as well um but yeah we do have a prize for you so producer matt will be in touch um how did the rest of team known and ever do then uh dave do you want to tell us how the rest of us did uh, well, just before that, uh, last year's champion was Bennett Howarth, who we've had on the uh, podcast a couple of times as well. We had him on, I think, the start of the season and then again uh, halfway through. Uh, he finished 28th position, so uh, a respectable finish there. He had 2,262 points, but was 236 points behind Sean in first place. But amongst us podcasters, uh, Tom, as we know, we had Tom on the uh, previous show, Tom doesn't uh, do the uh, Fantasy Premier League, although maybe we can convince him for next season. Tom, maybe get you to uh, have a go. Uh, well, after seeing the merciless uh, ribbon that Natalie gets yeah. for her bad team every week, I don't think I would be any better. So it's perhaps for the best that I, I stay out of it. <laughs> <laughs> he does. He's really, really mean to me, is Dave. He takes a mickey out of me every single week. And then, to make matters worse, we had on um, Adam who was at the time, who came second, he was our joint leader at the time. He came on to give us some hints and tips. And he just turned around to me and said, yeah, for you, Natalie, I've analysed your team and there's always next season, which was just the shade on that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's uh, there's no prisoners when you get yourself involved in, in the non and ever team anyway. Um what about the rest of us then, Dave? George Poole was uh, last amongst us uh, podcasters on the No Near Never, but he didn't actually change his team. He put his team at the start of the season, didn't make a single transfer all the way through, and uh, he was last out of us. He was 223rd out of 240 with 1,651 points. Uh, Natalie, good news, you beat George. Uh, just, uh, you were 10 points ahead of him. Uh, you had 1661 in 220th position. And then it was really, really close between the uh, rest of the three of us who were in the uh, Fantasy Premier League. Uh, producer Matt uh, had a good run towards the end. He finished 102nd uh, with 2000, uh, 2,075 points, uh, which was just uh, six behind me. I was in 99th place, uh, 2,081 points. And Rich... Rich won the uh, mini league. He was just 21 points out of me. I think I was just clawing it back right towards the end and thought I might have caught him up. But no, uh, Rich finished uh, 89th place with 2,102. So well done to Rich for winning our uh, mini league within a league. Excellent. And did you have some um, uh, some figures as to how our points differed from this time last year? I think I've seen these somewhere. Uh, I didn't compare it to last year. I, I, I've done the, just the difference between um, how far we were off uh, each other within the table. I think uh, I, I know I'd improved. I, I'd made an improvement. I think it's one of those things where you need to get into it. You need to um, look into it a little bit more. I think you, when you f- figure out what's going on with the uh, uh, free chips you get and the wild cards and all of those, you can actually make some improvements. So I'm, I'm looking at those figures now and thinking all of us have got some room for improvement for uh, for next season. Well, unfortunately, we can't actually ask Rich directly whether or not he is uh, excited about being the winner of our No Near Never Mini League because we've uh, we've lost him for the night. We've got team members dipping in and out tonight as, as we go along, so just bear with us as we get people um, to contribute. But we will get him to tweet his happiness when uh, at winning the the Mini League. Um, now, Dave, the other frequent feature that we have on the previous show is, of course, the much-loved weekly quiz and you have something quite exciting to announce to our listeners, don't you, for that quiz? Uh, we have. We, we hinted previously that we'd uh, planned a surprise to tide our listeners over during the summer um, as we try to give uh, you something to listen to during the 12 weeks uh, between the season ending and the start of the brand new season. Uh, and we can reveal we'll be recording a summer quiz. Uh, we want to get eight No Nay Never listeners. That's a few of our regular quizzes 
who we've been in touch with already in the uh, been, been in touch with us in the past uh, to answer our preview show quiz questions, uh, and a few of them have already agreed to put their names forward. But we're also looking for a few more contestants. Um, you may well have heard of the BBC's regular radio music quiz, Popmaster. Uh, well, we have gone one better, and we're looking for our Pope Master uh, <laughs> instead of <laughs> you like that, yeah. Uh, and instead of Ken Bruce, uh, we've gone one better than that, and we've lined up Burnley FC club commentator Phil Bird, legend, uh, to be our quiz master, um, as well as the prestige of being our summer quiz champion. Uh, I believe that producer Matt's sorting out a prize for the overall quiz champion. Uh, so if you want to book your place, uh, please do get in touch with us. You can either direct message us on Twitter, at never, or send us an email, podcast at never.net. Uh, and we'd love to get uh, the places filled up and get that scheduled in um, and get our Pope Master quiz going over the summer. Definitely. So do keep an eye on social media. And to help spice things up a bit, we are sending a mole into the quiz because we're going to be sending Nona Never's very own Tom Whitaker to be one of the contestants. Tom, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, I quite fancy myself. You know, I think I'm a pretty good, uh, a pretty good quizzer. Uh, uh, my my record on the uh, on the preview show may, maybe one in two, uh, but no, I, I think I can I can hold my own. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. You should do it. And, and were you not tempted, Natalie? No, no, I definitely wasn't. I was. <laughs> if John Robertson had decided to play, then I would. Actually, is John Robertson playing? No. I right, see. So if he'd have been playing, I might have been tempted just to to beat him and and call him out. No, I. It, it's one of those, as, as Dave knows, at the end of every single preview show, and I do try and answer the question, and sometimes I get it straight away, and sometimes my answers are so left field that literally Dave doesn't do anything but shake his head at me and just be like, you're an idiot. You're an actual idiot. Um, I think my my question, this is where Tom's a lot better than me, is that um, my, my memory doesn't recall facts quick enough. So I will get there eventually. So if you give me a question, and I'll, I won't need to look it up, and eventually after... A, about four weeks, I'll remember what the answer is and I'll be able to tell you. But in a time limit, like straight away, I really struggle with that. So, yeah, that that's going to be – we're going to be sending Tom, who's definitely our strongest um, strongest competitor. And, Tom, no pressure, but we're expecting you to bring home the trophy for none and ever, so don't let us down. I'm expecting uh, to be a bit like England in the Euros, probably, uh, you know, maybe sneak a quarter or a semi-final and then uh, a gallant next. <laughs> Okay, so then finally, before the end of the season, we are going to just crown the None and Never Alternative End of Season Awards. And these have been voted by you, the listeners, through the magic that is Twitter Sphere. Um, we put out five awards, did we? Five, six awards that we wanted you to vote on, which is our End of Season Awards, and they are just something a little bit different. So let us dive straight into those and crown each winner. We started off, number one, with our unsung hero of the season. And the shortlist for these players were Josh Brownhill, Eric Peters, Matt Lawton and Matty Vidra. Now, Tom, this was a really close category in the end, actually, with hardly any percentage points between them. Um, who did you who did you who did you vote for in this particular category? I think I went to Vidra overall. I think he is pretty uh pretty rated among the fan base, but I think um he brought a lot of he brought a lot of sort of overall contribution. It wasn't just goals. It was the the way the team played with him. Uh, we looked like a much more potent attacking force. And I think he had the most transformative effect on the team of, of any individual player. So that's why I went for Vidra. Well, actually, Vidra was the one who won it. Um, very, very close on this one. I think Eric Peters and Matt Lawton um, came in joint third place with 22.5% of the votes. Um, just above them with 254 was Josh Brownhill, but Matty Vidra did win the listeners' vote with 296 Um, Dave, I thought Eric Peters was in for a pretty decent shout to win this in the end with that heroic few games where he pretty much got our season back on track. Uh, he played everywhere apart from in goal, didn't he, I think, in the end. Uh, maybe yeah. it's um, it's one of those where if it happened later in the season, then you, your short-term memory remembers that more. So that's maybe Matthew Vidra coming good towards the end of the season. That's that's maybe why he got the nod in the end. That's who I voted for. I went for, uh, for Matthew Vidra for that one as well. 
Yeah, I did as well, but I very, very, very nearly went for for uh, Young Peters. Um, so second category again, and that was our moment of the season. Um, the shortlist for this that we put to you was the Barnes penalty at Anfield, ensuring survival at Fulham, me and Tarka getting back together at the Palace game, or the ALK takeover completed. Now, Dave, which one of these got your votes? Um, I'm just checking back, actually. I voted for the uh, Barnes penalty. I think it's uh, ending that uh, run of Liverpool, getting that win at Anfield, first one we'd had since 1974. That was um, the one for me. I think it's hard to look beyond uh, that one, really. Yeah, definitely. Um, Well, in fact, the Barnes penalty at Anfield was the one that was a very, very uh, easy win from our listeners. Um, Only 9% of our listeners voted for me and Tarky getting back together at Palace. Um, The ALK takeover came in third with 13.7%. Ensuring survival at Fulham was pretty important to a lot of you. That got 27.5%. But with a massive 49.8%, it was the Barnes penalty at Anfield. Um, And we spoke just before he disappeared and left us for the night. Rich did give us his thoughts on that penalty. Yeah, so the moment of the season that I voted for too was the Ashley Barnes penalty at Liverpool. Just an unbelievable moment. And I think it's easy to forget, you know, how significant or how impressive that victory was because Liverpool have lost a few games at home this season and maybe wasn't as... Well, definitely wasn't at at their best, but we was the first time to win them. Pretty sure it was the first team to beat them in a league game at Anfield for sixty nine years. And you know, it was one of those games where you felt, you know, maybe the you know the luck was in our favour a little bit. Obviously, Ben Mee made that mistake, and Origi missed a sitter where we hit the bar. And then second half, we just went from strength to strength, and you know, myself included, and you know, and Barnes Barnes has got his criticism. You know, quite you know, quite a lot of criticism in recent times, but that game it was absolutely superb. Really rustled, um, you know, the defenders all game, caused us caused some problems, and he never gives up on those loose balls. Um, you know, wins a penalty where Allison obviously comes off his line, and you know there was definitely some nerves jangling in the Steel household, but thankfully Barnes slotted it away coolly, and yeah, the uh, you know the re- the re- the reaction at full time. Um, I know a lot of Liverpool fans were sending them WhatsApp messages, videos, different things like that. Um, and it was just a fantastic moment. And I think but the story of this season is it's obviously, of course, a little bit bittersweet in the sense that, imag- you know, you wasn't at Anfield. Imagine the, the celebrations, you know, if the, if the Clavitz fans, you know, was in the away end that night. But, yeah, a fantastic moment. And even though it's been a, a difficult season, challenging, with, you know, without the fans, you know, that moment will live a lot long in the, long in the memory. Ah, oh, good stuff. Well, this links in quite easy and quite nicely to our third award of the evening. And I suspect that you probably will know which one this was. Um, We asked you what the match of the season was, and we gave you, again, a short list of four to vote on. Uh, Arsenal away, Villa at home, Liverpool away, or Wolves away. Now, no spoilers or probably no prizes for guessing which one was the absolute standout winner with this one, Tom. But was there was there any game other than Liverpool away that could have won this for you? Yeah, I actually voted for uh, for Villa at home. That was the game for me. Um, one of my favourite games we've had since we've been back in the Prem was uh, was the Palace at home. While we were two, uh, sorry, we were two up, we pegged it back to two apiece, and then we scored the last minute winner. Um, for me, that was a special one because I sit in the Jimmy Mac, so that winning goal going in just in front of me, with the, you know, right at the end, it, it was that was an incredible feeling, and, and I felt like I would have got the same from the Villa game. So, to one 0 down at half time, but three goals at the Jimmy Mac end in the second half. If I could have p- picked any game to be at, um, yeah, I think I probably would have gone for that one. Actually, I think I would have loved to be in the ground for that one and, and felt the atmosphere. So, yeah, that, a bit of a left uh, left field choice maybe, but but that was mine. That was. Uh, that was one of the games that I was really uh, good to miss out. Yeah, I think that one got my vote as well, to be honest, Tom. I, I, I it, That felt like it had turned the season round for me. And it's just a night with turf more under the floodlights is just something so special. I would have absolutely loved to have been there. Uh, but it, as was probably no surprise, that Liverpool away game and the Barnes penalty together uh, were our match of the season that you wanted to be at and our moment of the season. Um Moving away slightly to, uh, I guess, the implications of watching an entire season's football on the TV, um, award number four, we asked you what thing from having to watch on TV you will not miss. And each one of our known and ever panellists put forward their proposal for the shortlist for this. And these came from uh, being fake crowd noise, 
Um, the apologies for swearing, players screaming, or pundits being cold, particularly at Turf Moor. Um, Dave, I don't know which one of these did you were you one of these one of your nominations for a shortlist for these, and which one did you vote for? I don't think it was. I don't think I got asked, but um, I, I certainly went for the fake crowd noise. I think the fact that if we've got real crowds in there, we won't need to have the fake crowd noise, which, to be honest, I much prefer not to have it on. If it, Given the option when you're watching the games, I, I prefer not to have it on there. You, you know, you, Having the crowds in there is what we want going forward. So I think uh, that will that will mean that'll be a good sign for next season if it doesn't happen. Plus, looking at the other one, I think players will still scream. Um, although they won't be as heard as they, they would be with a crowd in. And the pundits are still going to be cold. So I think certainly uh, fake crowd noise stood out for me as the one to uh, we'll, we'll certainly not miss next season because the other ones, uh, some of them will still happen. Yeah, definitely. And and that was the one that did that. I think those listeners who um, do like to catch up with our international break specials that we sometimes do when we've got um, no Clarets games, you'll remember that we interviewed Alistair Campbell um, earlier on in this season. And that was one of the points that he made, actually, in that he refuses to listen to the fake crowd noise because he wants the TV game to be as, as uncomfortable as is humanly possible because he just doesn't want to hear, you know, he doesn't want us to get used to watching TV um, football, which I think is a really good point. Um, so, yeah, fake crowd noise got your vote as well, listeners, with a massive 42.8%. That is something that we are very much looking forward to seeing the back of. Uh, penultimate award of the night then, award number five, and that is um, slightly tongue-in-cheek, and I don't know why we agreed to do this, but uh, I think this might have been producer Matt's idea, actually, uh, funnily enough, because he's not involved in this. Um, it was the claim of the season from a known and never panellist that didn't age very well. So, yes, we've all dropped a few clangers at certain points this season, apart from Dave, who is... Dave has got a halo on. Uh, but certainly the regular panellists um, have said some stupid things this season that have very much come back to bite us. Um, so we put forward the four worst um, and let you vote on which ones we, uh, which ones you thought were the silliest. Um, so we have George, who claimed that Antonio... Uh, was no better than Barnes, which was hilarious, just as he scored another 45 goals against us. Um, Rich Steele said uh, all season, in fact, and wouldn't let up on this, that Fulham would definitely stay up this season, which we all laughed at from about week one. Um, I decided about six games to go that I suddenly got worried that West Brom might catch us and we didn't need to worry about um, Fulham. We were actually worrying about uh, West Brom, which was... In hindsight, not my finest hour. Um, but with a resounding victory and 40.7% of the votes goes to Mr. Jinx himself, Tom Whitaker, who declared when we were tuning up at Saints, saying that we were home and dry because this lot will never score two. And they ended up scoring three, Tom, and we lost the game. Explain yourself. Yeah, so technically I was right, weren't I? They didn't score two. So, you know, when you look <laughs> yeah, at you're not having that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hold my hands up to that one. It was a bad shout. Um, and I only hope that the people of Twitter have forgiven me. It wasn't the only one, though, was it? I think Tom Tom was on a roll. We could have chosen about five or six from Tom. That was the one that stood out. But there were several others as well. Yeah, definitely. So how do you feel winning that award, Tom? Are you proud of yourself? Uh, it's just it's nice to win an award, isn't it? I, I think probably the first award I've ever won in my life. So if you can get me something not for the I'll put it on the mantle <laughs> today, no problem. <laughs> my God. Honestly, no shame in it at all. Well, yes, well, well done, Tom. Um, I think we might keep that one for next season. It will be in our, it'll be the one that comes to haunt us. We'll all be getting really nervous. So we'll be acting like our panelists did tonight, having Dave on the podcast, because uh, normally they're uh, they're usually quite gung ho, but once Dave's on, they start uh, fact checking themselves. Uh, we come on to the final award of the evening, then, and that is the worst VAR decision involving Burnley. And, you know, God, VAR has been the topic of conversation for what's felt like forever now. Um, the shortlist that we give you to vote on, we had the Eric Peters handball against Arsenal. We had the Chris Wood being dragged against Saints. We had the Areola, is that how you pronounce it? The handball. And finally, we had Ben Mee being absolutely clattered at Leeds. Now, Tom, again, massively, unsurprisingly, and by a massive massive advantage, the Ben Me clattering at Leeds was the one that got the viewers' vote. Uh, still to this day, I can't quite understand how that just wasn't given. 
Do you know what? When we were thinking about the choices for the categories, you know, I, I guess it's the recency bias thing again. And like, there wasn't any that massively stood out to me, um, you know, apart from the area or the handball because it was it had happened so recently. But then, as soon as uh, I think it was producer Matt mentioned the uh, the Leeds game, and it was just like, oh god, yeah, I think maybe I just tried to erase it from my mind. But yeah, egregious decision. I think <laughs> the referee who's not experienced enough at Premier League level to know how to referee with VAR. I think he just blew the whistle far too quickly, didn't give himself any thinking time, and more importantly, didn't give the VAR chance to correct the glaringly bad decision he'd made. And, uh, yeah, the frustration of it being very obviously the wrong decision, but the fact that he'd blown the whistle too soon, meaning that VAR wasn't able to intervene, just showed a lot of the problems that are there with the system and uh, and the problems with the refereeing that we've got at the minute. So, yeah, uh, definitely the most egregious example uh, for this season. Yeah, definitely. Well, that that is it. That is the that is the end of season awards, and that concludes our um, coverage for the analysis show and the Non and Ever podcast. That is it. We are done. Another season under our belts, and it's time to sign off for a summer. Um, you have got Dave's uh, wonderful. Uh, summer pop master quiz to look forward to so do keep an eye on that um but we are going to take a very much deserved break over the summer we're gonna um recover from that very bizarre season we're going to look forward to having fans back in stadiums and we're going to uh, recharge those batteries and think about how can we make the podcast um fresher and better and more exciting for you next season the team will be back next season so before we sign off we want to hear from you what have you liked about the podcast this season what have you not liked what would you like us to include what do you want us to bin off um drop us some suggestions as i said before you can tweet us at known and ever or you can email us at podcast at known and ever.net and we will be getting our heads together this season to bring you a new fresh and exciting podcast next summer so all that leaves for me now to do is to thank everybody who has um contributed to this season's podcast there have been many to mention and i'm going to try my very best to remember Remember everybody now um so please do forgive me if we do uh, leave anybody out but we of course we start off with um all of our special guests who've contributed to the podcast this season we have had our international breaks with alistair campbell with jordan north and with local journalists chris borden alex james and andy jones all of whom gave up their time to get to give us some filler episodes while the clarets run international breaks which was very much appreciated and they are really good episodes you should tune in and uh, have a look at those if you haven't done during the summer to help with your summer break um to band joyce who every single year give us their uh, music jingles for royalty free which we very much appreciate thank you uh, dominic walker the turf more stadium announcer has given us the preview show um, special look announcements this season uh, whilst we couldn't be at turf more we brought turf more to you which was really uh, really great of him to do um to the none and ever team. Um, there is a team that sits around us all who have been here all season. Um, the team give up their time for free. We are a non-profit podcast. We don't make any money from the podcast. All of the team members give up their time for free just because we love doing it. And it's a community-based podcast that we enjoy putting out there. So um, to all of my colleagues, to Tom, to Rich, to George, to Robbie, to Liam, for Dave for all of his work on the previous show, and of course to producer Matt, who does everything behind the scenes, um, who quite frankly, especially this episode, whose who's technical expertise we would um, not be able to live without. Um, but our final thanks go to you, the listeners, for sticking with us all season. This has been a season like no other. Um, you've stayed with us. We've got through this together. We have got through as much analysis as we could without being on turf more. But next season's going to be different because we're going to see you all at the turf. Um, the team are going to be around helping out with the food bank for BFC in the community. Um, so do come and say hello to us when we're um, helping take donations for, for the food bank drive. Um, and if you see us at the ground, you know, ask Tom for a selfie and ask him to record his, his pre-match routine for you. Or just come and say hello to us all because we are a friendly bunch and we'd love to, to meet you all and hear your thoughts on the Clarets season. Have a fantastic summer in the meantime. Enjoy the Euros. Stay safe, everyone. And by the time we see you again, the world will look like a very different place. Um, that's it. We sign off. I've been Natalie Bromley. This has been the Non and Ever podcast. Until next time.